All right. So hello, everyone. My name is Robert, and I work as a technical writer at Red Hat. Thank you for interest in this topic and in the topic of documentation in general. And uh, it is kind of unfortunate that uh, this talk wasn't scheduled before Paul's before, if you've been here before for talk, uh, Paul's documentation talk. I'm going to talk about how to actually write documentation, uh, whereas he talked about uh, more the process and uh, how to get the written documentation out there. Anyway, uh, uh, in this presentation, what I'm going to be talking about, first I'm going to quickly touch upon terminology, what I mean when I say old documentation or legacy documentation, and what I mean by those new tricks or new documentation. Also, I'm going to briefly mention why even bother, why to, why to be interested in that. Then I'm going to outline what I perceive uh, as the problem and uh, also what uh, could or should be our solution. So let us get started. About the terminology. Old documentation, well, it doesn't really have to be old. And uh, I have to admit that uh, I very much like the title of teaching old docs, new tricks. But uh, you know, this old documentation that I'm going to be talking about uh, that can also sometimes be called legacy, uh, there's really nothing wrong with it. Uh, but uh, what I mean by it is uh, the sort of uh, big uh, administration guides, installation guides, or net networking guides, that kind of stuff. Those uh, sometimes are called even books. And uh, as I said, nothing really wrong about them. They uh, tend to be comprehensive. The criterion for uh, quality is there the completeness. They want to describe every last feature that there is, meaning that they really are feature-based. They want to describe everything there is to be described about a specific project or a product or a piece of software. Now, such documentation could be very, very useful for a person who, for example, needs to pass a test or gain a certification or something like that. On the other hand, the fact that it really needs to be complete, otherwise it's by definition incomplete, uh, means that uh, it takes a lot of time and so forth. I'm going to go into that later on, but uh, there are very many problems with that, especially with maintenance of such documentation. So. Uh, to get around some of those problems, uh, the new documentation or the uh, documentation that uh, new tricks have been applied to uh, would be uh, an opposite of that. It does not strive to be complete and comprehensive. Instead, it tries to be as much targeted and as specific as possible. It's uh, very lean. It tries to be very concise, and it's not uh, usually grouped into big books or uh, guides. Instead, they, uh, it is presented and also written as uh, very uh, short or to the point articles or units or pieces of docs that try each on, a, on their own to solve a specific problem, to answer a goal, uh, answer, answer a question, how to, how to get towards a specific goal. So that's about the terminology. Now, about the why. Well, part of it, as I mentioned, is that there are some definite problems with uh, maintaining documentation that is based on features and that tries to be comprehensive and complete. Also, there are some, uh, uh, there are some considerations uh, with regard to the fact that uh, nowadays, uh, it's not so much about uh, the software or the system. It's more about uh, what the user is trying to accomplish with that. So while we still have, uh, for example, the monolithic distributions that I'm mentioning here, such as Fedora, Ubuntu, Debian, and so forth, and also other systems such as Android or other ones, uh, they do exist. But uh, the way they are being used, uh, such as in containers or that Android, if you ask uh, your average cell phone user what they're using on their cell phone, they're probably not going to be able to tell you that it's actually Linux, meaning that uh, the specificity of that particular piece of software or a system, the fact that it is some sort of a software, does not really concern them, does not really bother them. Therefore, they're not going to be interested in Linux documentation. They're going to be interested in documentation that tells them how to accomplish stuff, how to 
get rid of uh, a specific task that is on their to-do, meaning that uh, the packaging of software and of the products that we're used to is changing. And uh, the documentation that has been designed for those uh, big distributions, such as, you know, it could be your general Linux administration guide, does not really cut it for, you know, such landscape. Also, hand in hand with that, goes the way the software is being delivered. Because uh, while we still have some release cycles, they're not really being that important. And also, there are some uh, applications or even entire systems that are not being released as a version 1.0, 1.1, 1.2, then there's another major version, and so forth. While maybe the underlying system or the application that is actually facilitating the achievement of a goal does have, you know, somewhere underneath, beneath the hood, there still is a versioning system. Uh, what the user sees is a continuous deployment. And that uh, application or that system or a service could be deployed several times a day. Every time you push a fix to the repository, it goes through some sort of a CI CD process and gets deployed and the user gets to use it all of a sudden or uh, as soon as they you know, reload the web page or something like that. So if we have a documentation, a piece of documentation or a, or, or a guide or a book that addresses uh, how to use uh, that piece of software you know, with version 2.0, well, it's not really cutting it for this sort of environment because the user is not really interested in that. And also, that piece of documentation grows stale very quickly. So uh, it becomes obsolete before you even finish writing it. And uh, therefore, uh, there comes the advantage of those you know, lean, concise units, pieces of documentation, which can be updated and kept up to date with uh, much less difficulty. So I'm getting into what the problems are with uh, this sort of old documentation. Well, uh, even though I'm a technical writer, you probably would not expect me to say that there is too much of that documentation. That's a weird thing to say because usually people tend to think that you know, documentation is missing. But the fact is that uh, if anyone ever gets to write this piece of documentation, such as the administration guide or a security guide, well, that, uh, because it tries to be complete and comprehensive, is just a lot of content. So not only it gets difficult to maintain, it also tends to lead to duplication because, uh, you know, while something may be described as security guide, well, a piece uh, very similar to that could be described as a networking guide as well, or a system administration guide. So all in all, it tends to lead to the content rot because as much as we would like to, we always have limited resources. We don't really have that many people to maintain that documentation. So we are trying to get down, whittle down the documentation, cut away the pieces that don't really need to be there, and only document the stuff that really needs to be documented. I'm gonna get into that. Another piece of the problem is that the documentation is really hard to navigate because uh, not that it would be particularly difficult to locate the documentation, but if a user wants to accomplish a certain task or they're being given uh, a task by their boss and you know, they need to finish it yesterday, they're not really interested in learning a whole lot about a particular system. Instead, they just need to get to a certain point. You know, they need to go from A to B without really needing to understand you know, the rest of the alphabet. So how do they know how to do that? Well, for example, if they need to do something with a, I don't know, perhaps a file server, so is that gonna be a part of the administration guide? Is that gonna be a part of the security guide, perhaps, if that file server needs to be secured? Is that gonna be a part of the networking guide or some sort of a general user guide? Well, the truth is that it's very likely that pieces, bits and pieces of the required information is going to be in all of those guides. In one, you know, there's gonna be this little bit, there's gonna be that little bit in the other guide. And in the end, the user is going to be asked the very unlikely you know, scenario that they know the entire contents of those guides. So they're gonna have to hunt around and piece those puzzles together themselves instead of being able to follow a single piece of documentation that takes them from that A to their B. So uh, what we are trying to solve you know, by, by actually 
you know, being aware of this problem and then trying to do something with it is to make it easier for users to consume the documentation, make it easier uh, on them so that they don't have to be, you know, that they, they don't really have to be uh, very knowledgeable about uh, entire pieces of software, about, about entire operating systems. And, you know, as I mentioned here, instead of, uh, you know, trying to locate all of those pieces of the puzzle, they just give up and they Google it and they end up going to Stack Overflow or something, which in and of itself is not a bad thing, except it, you know, kind of reflects poorly on the written documentation because it's not being used for its purpose. So what could be the solution or what is the solution as we try to identify it? Well, as I mentioned, we only try to document the stuff that the users really need, what they want to have documented and what they want to read because, you know, as everybody knows, nobody really likes to read documentation, especially if there's a lot of it. So we try to identify and make sure that such user stories as we come up with are really valid, that they're the ones that the users are really interested in and that they do not, A, contain any fluff and also they do not try to educate the user unnecessarily about all kinds of different problems. Instead, they only focus on the stuff that they are really interested in. And in the process, well, we try to cut, on the amount, cut down on the amount of content so that there is less to maintain and also it's easier for the user to consume. Therefore, we're using our resources better because we're always going to have limited resources, be it a product, be it a company or an open source project. There's also gonna be too few people and for documentation that, you know, that holds true as well, well, maybe sometimes even double. Another part of that solution, what could be, is what we like to call modular writing, and that means not only making those uh, pieces of documentation or articles of documentation, you know, lean and concise, and uh, uh, those units being, you know, as small as possible, but also making it, making the entire process of the documentation easier for people or for new people who come onto the project so that uh, they can get onboarded really quickly and they can start uh, with uh, whatever you know, they're good at. So for that, uh, for that particular thing, we have developed templates that make that writing of the documentation easier. It does not, you know, having a template that you can you know, fill in the blanks as could be even considered, that does not really take away the responsibility from the technical writer the technical expertise is still required and it's still required to you know, make sure that you're actually documenting something that needs to be documented. The fact is that such a template makes it easier for even an experienced writer to get started. It gives them some sort of a structure. And another thing is that uh, if uh, documentation, you know, that, you know, those units or modules of documentation are based on specific templates, it makes, uh, it makes that uh, entire result of the documenting process uh, more consistent. Therefore, if you know, one writer write, writes one piece of documentation, another writer writes a continuation of that piece of documentation, both of them using the same template, it means that for the user it's going to be easier to consume because uh, if they're both following the same template, that documentation is just going to follow the same structure. It's just going to be not only easier on the eyes, it's just going to be easier to understand and comprehend because it's going to follow the same, uh, the same flow, the same structure. Last but not least, as I've mentioned up front, it's easier for new people to get started with that because they're not being asked to you know, fix the administration guide or you know, write a new chapter for the security guide or something like that. They can take these little pieces, you know, they only document a certain procedure or they document a certain concept that they're familiar with or that they can learn about relatively quickly. So it's that sort of a low hanging fruit. And by making it like this, you know, by turning the entire body of documentation into this templated modular documentation, we're basically turning the entire volume of the documentation that we need to have into low-hanging fruit because it's just easier to pick up. So those modular pieces make it, uh, make it just simpler to get started. Therefore, we save time, again, use our resources more efficiently and make it easier for new contributors to whatever documentation project there is to, to get on board. So. Uh, when I was talking about feature-based versus user-based or uh, user story-based documentation, uh, 
I've put together this slide whereby I try to, you know, make sure, you know, to drive down the, the differences. I'm going to let you read through those, you know, on the left you've got those features, on the right you've got a user story. I've tried to pick something that, that could be really accessible and easy to, easy to understand. And it's about onions, as you can see. Now I'm going to come back to what I've said before. There is nothing wrong with feature-based documentation. In an ideal world, we would have both pieces or both kinds of the documentation. We would have enough resources to be able to afford to deliver to the users you know, both feature-based and user story-based documentation. That would be great. However, in real world, we are always short of resources, and therefore, we're trying to choose the way that delivers, you know, that, that there's a bigger bang for the buck. Basically, we're trying to make sure that we direct those resources to something that is really going to help users with their particular pain points that they have right now. We're not trying to educate them anymore about those whole pieces of systems or you know, whole software uh, distributions. Instead, we're trying to you know, handhold them as they're trying to achieve their goals, as they're trying to walk you know, from that A to B. Therefore, as you see, as I said, nothing wrong without you know, learning all there is to know about onions and how to use those onions and how to use eggs and that kind of stuff. But if a person wants to make an omelet, well, nah, well, they're probably going to figure it out sooner or later. Maybe they're going to have to you know, read some other pieces of documentation that also talks about you know, all that other stuff that you actually need to know about you know, making an omelet. But in uh, converting or adapting you know, the, the documentation that we already have into, user story, into this user story-based approach, we're just making it a whole lot easier for the user to follow those instructions from start to end so that they can actually accomplish their goal by following those instructions instead of trying to piece together those individual pieces of the puzzle. And as I mentioned down here, that user story could be, um, you know, as an amateur cook, I want to make an onion omelet so that I can impress my friends. I'm sure you're all familiar with that agile formula for, you know, for, uh, for a user story as you know, some sort of a user, I want to accomplish some sort of a goal so that something you know, gets in the process resolved. Uh, so that's the, same, that's the same user story that we're using over here. I just wanted to put this slide here so to make it, to make it you know, really clear what I consider the difference between a feature-based documentation and a user story-based documentation. And again, emphasize that there's really nothing wrong with either one of those, but in order to you know, maintain our sanity and also be, be able to support the users who actually consume the documentation. We want to choose the, choose the approach that uh, delivers the value more quickly and with uh, less difficulty. So, uh, how do we go about that and how do we, you know, write those user story based uh, pieces of docs? Well, we have developed, as I said, a set of templates and uh, those templates are for the so-called assemblies and modules. Well, by an assembly, uh, we call, you know, that is uh, the, the already documented user story. We have a user story that we have identified and we have validated it. We have made sure that that user story is actually something that the users are interested in and that they need to have documented. And then, you know, when, when we have formulated it, we uh, take an assembly template and that template calls for the inclusion of modules. As you see here, we could have a, you know, a module for a concept, module for procedures, and so forth. We have some other templates as well. The point here is that really it, it, it is something that can be uh, thought of as, uh, as like a kid's play. You, know, you just put those pieces together and you can mix and match. Therefore, you know, one procedure module could uh, figure in this assembly, also in another assembly, making it easier to single source and reuse those individual units of documentation. So every assembly slash user story would have some sort of an introduction. That introduction usually would not be reusable in other pieces of docs because otherwise we would make it into, a, for example, a concept module. But other than that, that, there would be a concept module. It's not necessary, but sometimes 
It is better to describe some sort of a concept to get the users to understand the context. And there could be one or more procedure modules that actually outline the steps. And I'm going to describe later on what all those could look like. And at the end, there could be, uh, again, to tie it back to the other pieces of documentation that we have been writing. So there could be a section with additional resources, meaning that we are linked to other assemblies or other modules, or we may be linking to other external pieces of information. And uh, as I've already said, the assembly would be you know, a documentation of realization of a user story. We have a user story that is being formulated, and we create an assembly to document that user story. Into that assembly, we put this introduction. Therefore, there needs to be some sort of a title to make it unique, such as making an anomaly. We should also describe the purpose. If that user stumbles upon that piece of documentation, they should have, uh, they should have clarity with regard to you know, what is it for, what I'm going to accomplish if I actually go down this road. And if needed, we can list some prerequisites. What needs to be already in place so that that particular user story can be followed to a successful conclusion. Now comes the first reusable piece of uh, information, the first documentation unit that can actually be single source to a different, uh, different user stories. Uh, now here I've chosen a concept module. Again, it would have a title, it would describe the, con the concept, and it could in and of itself also have links to additional resources that you know, like, uh, like any other module. In this case, I've chosen understanding the importance of omelets in French cuisine. Now, you don't re really need to know that uh, in order to be able to, to, to fry an omelet. On the other hand, if, um, you know, if the end goal is to impress your friends, you will definitely score some more points if you actually understand the importance in French cuisine. And that there would be the procedure modules. And again, those would, be try, those would try to be very lean and concise. They would only list what needs to be in there. They would tell the user specifically what to do. Go there, open this, configure that, set up that, delete that thing, and so forth, and you're done with that particular procedure. Of course, again, there would be a title. There might be a purpose or prerequisites if desired or required. And an important thing as talking about those modules in order to be able to reuse them in other pieces of documentation, we need to make them uh, self-sufficient. So they need to be able to stand on their own. If a user navigates to an individual module that gets displayed on their web page, for example, they need to immediately know where they're being, what they're being told. So such a module, for example, cannot really uh, say, well, you, you know, you read this far, so now you already understand all that needs to be understood. Now let's go forward. Because that wouldn't really work, because we need to observe that principle that you're probably familiar with, that every page is page one. So if a user navigates to a piece of that documentation, they happen to stumble upon a middle of something that we consider a piece of docs, they need to understand that either they really are in the middle and they need to start, meaning you know, there would be those prerequisites and they would understand immediately that they have not met those prerequisites, or they would be able to start right from that space. They would be able to you know, either continue or start the whatever procedure or task from the piece or from the page to, the, uh, to which they have navigated. Therefore, each of those modules needs to stand on their own also, it wouldn't make any sense if you were to create a module that would only make sense in one assembly slash user story, because then that module would not really be a piece of reusable documentation. You would, you would have no use for that in any other assembly, and therefore you know, it would defeat the purpose. And if such a piece of um, information was really, really required for that particular assembly, well, you would need to put that into, for example, that introduction piece that is specific to that particular user story. And finally, we would have those additional resources that I said before. It could be links to other related modules or pieces of documentation. It could be links to other websites, manual pages, whatever you, you know, or perhaps other onion recipes. And, uh, you know, I'm including this link over here so that if you'd be interested, all of this stuff is already online and on GitHub and can be used and reused by anyone who'd be interested in those uh, 
templates uh, for all of the modules and assemblies that we have put together are pretty self-explanatory and they include their internal comments and documentation. So it should be very clear to anyone who would want to use this system how to actually do that. But on top of that, uh, this uh, particular GitHub repository that I'm linking to also includes uh, documentation, you know, some, some sort of a reference manual that, uh, that goes into a little bit more depth about how to use those individual templates. So, one thing that I want to mention, uh, not really go into much, you know, much, much depth, but uh, what this really allows us also to do is not only to make the documentation easier to write and easier to consume, but uh, there is another avenue that can be explored, and that is a modular presentation of the documentation. So we're not only looking at the source code of the documentation here, but we're also looking how to exploit that, uh, uh, the fact that those you know, individual pieces of documentation can be mixed and matched uh, uh, in, uh, in the way we're presenting the user to, doc, uh, to uh, in the way we're presenting to the user that documentation. So uh, instead of what we have now, or you know, what, what are the traditional ways of treating documentation when it gets published, and it's, you know, it could be either an article, it could be that book, or it could be some sort of a paged structure uh, that you can you know, flip through or navigate through. This modular, uh, this modular stuff, this modular structure of the documentation would allow us to work much more efficiently with metadata, and therefore being able to filter the entire volume of documentation that we have based on that metadata. So that, for example, if a user would be only interested in security topics about a specific piece of software in a specific uh, part of the life cycle, meaning, for example, only the configuration part or only the maintenance part or something like that, they could select that in the, using the metadata and uh, when they do, only those particular pieces of documentation, those modules, those units that pertain to all, uh, you know, to those topics that have been filtered by the metadata get displayed. Some uh, logic could be also built into that, a uh, bit of uh, artificial intelligence that would, uh, for example, work with, uh, you know, what sort of a user is that? For example, if that would be on the Red Hat customer portal, it could work with uh, the uh, idea about you know, what sort of software, what sort of licenses that user has, so that the uh, metadata could be pre-selected for that particular user. Also, it could be based on, uh, you know, based on uh, customer accounts, for example, uh, saved uh, you know, for that particular user's preferences. So you would know that that user only uses OpenStack, is not really interested in any of the other middleware stuff. So you know, we would not uh, include that uh, stuff in his search results, and so forth and so forth. Uh, it really lets, lends itself into, into uh, you know, uh, lots of ideas, and we already started working on those, but I have not gotten really far but uh, it's all on paper at this point and with uh, uh, in only some, uh, some, some, some very proof of concept implementations. But it looks very promising and uh, it's something that uh, we're very pleased to learn that that modular structure of documentation um, lends itself to. So uh, to wrap it up, uh, I just wanna you know, emphasize some of the main points that I've been talking about here going from the old to the new. So A, or most importantly, the old documentation or the legacy documentation is based on features, and therefore, if not all features are described, the documentation is incomplete. Therefore, it's not really, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't really work for the user if, uh, if it's not in, entirely comprehensive. On the other hand, with the new documentation or with the new approach, we're not striving for completeness. Instead, we're striving for very specific particular targeting. We're trying to make sure that the stuff that we document is only the things that the users are mostly interested in. Of course, we're not gonna be able to satisfy everybody. There's always going to be that person who will want to use Fedora on their you know, fridge in the kitchen or something like that, and we're not going to be able to you know, document those user stories that that particular person is interested in. But we're going to be probably able, if we are very careful and meticulous with the 
uh, identification and validation of the user stories, we're going to be able to cover uh, some, uh, some very nice percentage of, uh, of users, and therefore of the user stories that the general user base is interested in. That uh, leads into the cutting down on the amount of content. We try to reduce the amount of content, uh, not only because it is hard to maintain, it is hard to navigate. It is hard to wrap your head around about where that particular piece of information should be found. So we try to focus on small pieces of documentation, making it both easier for the writers to write as well as for the people, for, for the people to consume. And last but not least, uh, there's, the, there's the modular presentation. There's the, there's the sort of a new, new generation of how to present documentation. And that is uh, trying to go away from the static uh, navigation that usually does not lend itself much to customization into, uh, into this modular presentation where it can be highly hierarchical, it can be based on metadata, and the navigation could be much more dynamic than it is now. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. If anybody has any questions, uh, I'd like to try to answer them now. If not, I have some discussion points uh, that uh, have frequently come up. Uh, sure. Uh, do you, in, the, in a module, the prerequisites can be, you know, it's very easy to understand what to put in to a particular module. But the feedback I get from reviewers is that in the context of the assembly, So the question, if I understand it correctly, is that if uh, some prerequisite steps or points are included not only um, one time at the beginning of a user story or an assembly, but they're also included for every individual module, then it might get confusing for the user because they're not really able to understand what those prerequisites are or why they have not been included in the first place at the beginning of the entire user story. Is that correct? No, I mean more about say there are two procedures in an assembly, and the uh, in the context of the assembly, uh, it looks better if you don't say, you know, make sure you've completed procedure one before doing procedure two, because in the context of the assembly, it, it's obvious that you have to do both procedures. Right. Um, so that, that, the question or piece of feedback actually is that if you include in, you know, for example, a procedure two, a prerequisite that says you must have completed procedure one in order to be able to continue here, uh, it gets some, um, you know, it, it looks funny because it looks unnecessary. Pe you know, people who have already been following that assembly right from the start, they, they, they think it's obvious. So yeah, uh, that, that is a problem. Uh, and there are several ways or several approaches to, to, to solving that or to, to trying to, to mitigate that problem. And that is one, if you really want to make sure that, as I said, you know, every page is page one, meaning that every one of those procedures uh, can be or can exist without uh, actually you know, having some sort of a dependence on, on a particular procedure right in front of it, then, then you really have no choice. You have to include that there. Uh, so I understand that it can get, you know, confusing or not, maybe not confusing, but it look, looks arbitrary in that particular piece of uh, documentation. What you're trying to explore is, for example, uh, with the new presentation, is that um, all of these pieces, uh, all of these sections uh, of the templates and thereby of the, of the modules would be collapsible. And therefore, um, you know the the logic. If uh, the logic would be that if uh, if a module get display gets displayed right after another module, it's not being displayed on its own. Then these prerequisites would be by default collapsed. They would not really you know stand there and take up space. If the user would be interested in or just wanted to make sure, they could you know click a, a button or an arrow or something, and uh, that, you know, that section would be displayed to them as well, but it would not be displayed by default. Whereas, 
if, uh, if the browser or the system would detect that uh, you know, this module is being displayed on its own, and therefore the you know, every page is of H1 principle would need to be uh, observed, then this, you know, none of that would be collapsed and it would all be displayed in its entirety by default and therefore it would serve its purpose. So but yeah, it could be a problem, but we're trying to you know, work around that and still we're recognizing that it's a you know, uh, lesser problem than not having it. Uh, yeah. Any other questions? Well, if not, then I'm going to thank you.